Um, I have the wonderful privilege of introducing uh, Kwan this evening. Um, so Kwan is actually our inaugural Emerging Practitioner Fellow, um, which uh, for those of you who don't already know about it, um, this is our inaugural year, and it's very exciting for us to actually be able to bring in an emerging practitioner to the school uh, to both teach but also develop their practice uh, and, and research related to their practice. And I think this is a really exciting and kind of unique model because it also allows us to bring outside voices to the school whose work uh, and experiences uh, may actually be very different from the kind of existing faculty. Um, and it allows us to bring in someone with new view viewpoints and join the school uh, in that way. Um, and so I know you all also have, um, some of you have Kwan in, in studio right now. Um, so I think it's a very exciting moment uh, that we can actually be in these kinds of dialogues. Um, so uh, Kwan is an associate and licensed architect whose interests include uh, professional practice and academia from the scale of community planning and engagement to detail and material, materiality of interiors and furniture design. So I think uh, this is actually quite a unique set of skills that Quan brings that bridges both um, the design aspects of things, but also this question of uh, kind of community values, lived experience, and a community's way of life. Uh, his work includes working in several offices in Toronto, Montreal, Paris, and New York City, where he contributed and led numerous high-profile uh, conceptual and built works across North America, Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Uh, Quan has designed also several exhibitions, uh, and most recently, um, I had the privilege of being able to see this in person, uh, Quan put together an exhibition around the future of Ontario Place. Um, and it brought together the voices of students, academics, urban activists, and the general public. Um, and it, it uh, yeah, there was quite a lot of, I think, media coverage uh, and dialogue around what, is it, what does it mean to participate that, in that? And I think unique to um, the way that Quan works is Quan also brings these opportunities to students to include all of you in this dialogue um, as the kind of shapers of the future um, of our profession and our built environment. Um, and so I'm really excited to see uh, Quan kind of bring that kind of work to our school uh, and the kinds of conversations we're gonna have collectively as well. Um, the exhibition received funding from the School of Cities, uh, Small Programs Grant, and the OAA uh, Public Aw Awareness Award. Um, he has taught and continues to teach in several architectural schools uh, and remains connected to his community through his volunteer efforts uh, for several charitable and nonprofit organizations, uh, which includes the 519, the Toronto Society of, Society of Architects, um, as well as serving as a mentor for the OAA Intern Architect Program. Uh, so Quan received his architectural training uh, from right here at the University of Waterloo, as well as McGill University. Uh, and during his graduate studies, he won uh, the first place award in a design competition for rethinking the industrial lands to foster sustainable and regenerative communities uh, through urban agricultural research uh, in Montreal's uh, Point St. Charles. Um, and so very excited to also hear how some of the continuity of that work that was kind of shaped in your education leads to your practice today. Um, and for all of the students uh, joining us today as well, I think it's really exciting for you to kind of think about where you are in your trajectory um, and how those influences kind of continue to build um, as you move through your careers. Um, so please join me in a warm welcome of Quan. Thank you, Linda, for the introduction, Tara for introducing the lecture series as well. Um, I'm very excited to be here. It's a bit strange to be in this position uh, because I do really remember what it was like standing here as a student uh, many, many years ago. Um, but different context, and I'm excited to really share what has happened since then. Um, but I'll, I'll really be diving into my experiences, let's say, wrapping up from Waterloo and how that's changed over the past uh, how that's changed over the courses of the past few years, um, and how that starts to really build, um, let's say, some understanding in terms of how my own lived experiences start to perhaps permeate into some of these other realms of, that are quite important to me. Um, so, uh, first and foremost, uh, just a little bit of an introduction about me. Um, as Linda had mentioned earlier, I did complete my undergraduate degree here. This really led me to um, seek out different opportunities in different cities uh, where I got to experience many, many different things, work at really interesting firms, and ultimately landed me uh, at graduate school in McGill. Um, a little bit more about just my general background as well. I am a first generation Canadian, eldest son to refugees, uh, and also a member of a sexual minority. And so I do believe that as I think about these intersectionalities, there's probably a lot of these things that have 
formulated in my head these questions that I had uh, thought about as I, as I went through my career, whether it was in school, whether it was in the community, whether it was in practice. And I do think that a lot of these challenges that I've encountered have also allowed me to overcome um, and, and come out more with an empathetic approach to how I approach uh, or how I speak to and engage with different communities around me. <clears throat> um, I do think that this perspective has also really allowed me to contribute back to the various communities. I've always been a volunteer, um, I guess since I was young. I, I don't know what young means, but as, let's say, uh, elementary school, high school, I was always doing stuff outside of what I was, let's say, given um, as a task. And so this, this continuity has also transferred through into what I'm currently doing now, where I'm, I'm still involved in the community in various ways, but also in communities that are a bit more representative to me, that I find quite important to me, and that I'll continue to, um, let's say, uh, build relationships with. And so that, that's uh, the involvement, thank you, <laughs> um, let's say in, at the 519 that Linda mentioned, where I first started off generally just as a volunteer, but volunteering and kind of engaging enough to build that relationship and now becoming a team lead for a group of volunteers and also training different volunteers as well. Um, but also professionally thinking about how I can start to share some of this experience with other like-minded individuals through my role at the Toronto Society of Architects, um, where I engage in multiple and various types of uh, networking events as well. So um, this is me during my 4B review uh, back in 2013. Um, very perhaps tired looking face and trying to understand what was actually going on at that moment because I was probably very tired. I would like to hope that from this point on, if I were to reflect back on this experience, I probably have a better understanding of what these conversations more, were more about. But again, this is really gonna start as that, that starting point for the rest of the talk as well. Um, my lecture is entitled Enact, uh, but before this inaction, let's say, has happened to where I'm currently at, I do reflect back on some of these pivotal moments throughout my trajectory that have perhaps influenced or even changed my perspective on understanding what architecture, let's say capital A architecture, uh, means to me. And you, so you can think of them as different chapters, let's say, within, within this talk. Um, quite simply, I am trained traditionally as an architect. Uh, as Linda had mentioned, I've worked and practiced at various firms across the world. I've worked on different scales of projects from the scale of the planning of city, cities and urban design, master plans, all the way down to the interiors of very small spaces, as well as understanding furniture um, at a material scale as well. Um, if I were to think about, let's say, the idea of envisioning, um, this is the, the time where I, let's say, finished my undergraduate degree, I started working at different offices. It was particularly at a time when I moved to New York after my undergraduate studies. Uh, I worked at an office called Work AC. That particular studio really allowed me to think about what architecture could potentially be because Work AC was a studio that really focused uh, on providing a position that deeply engages cultural history, um, histories in general, uh, different perspectives of climatic and the, uh, of the environment, but also the people using these spaces. And this really was a kind of pivotal point to really opening my eyes in terms of what the potentials are. And if I'm thinking about this as an overall broader question of why I came to architecture school, it was always that really, let's say, um, uh, ambitious goal of oh creating a better place or creating a better world creating a nicer a nicer space for people and this mentality again really cued in when I went to grad school where I was able to really open uh, some doors in exploring different methods of investigation I do think perhaps during my undergraduate studies I was always so focused on just getting whatever I need to get done and I'm sure some of you ruminate with that as well but that the opportunity to really think and reflect on, okay, I'm starting to get a set of skills, but how do I now move that forward to think about um, new ideas as well? And so um, how can these perhaps subsequently start to foster new types of methods of engaging um, different types of context and community? Um, these are obviously larger questions that I'm still currently exploring in my current work, but as an example, I can take you through um, one particular project that uh, was mentioned earlier. So this is a, an active industrial yard in the, uh, for a logistics company in Point St. Charles in Montreal. Um, during grad school, I had the opportunity to collaborate with one of my good friends, uh, Milan Malinier Roy, um, to work on a competition where we were asked to really imagine or reimagine the post-industrial landscape um, for this really large site. It's about 13 acres. Um, and this was also, again, that, that a pivotal point to really start exploring some of these ideas or these questions I had of what can architecture be beyond just the given program. And so we really, for this competition, we had to come up with basically everything, uh, including program, to really pitch a more innovative solution to the site. 
So our submission was entitled uh, Pawnee Cultures and approached the challenge of the competition through a lens that was very much grounded in site research and site analysis. Um, the intervention draws upon opportunities of the unique site conditions itself, its adjacencies to different major circulation arteries, train yards, uh, sorry, a train, train rails, as well as a very flourishing and diverse community uh, in Point St. Charles. And the goal of the development was to really think about the methods to how, how do we remediate a site that is historically perhaps undergone so much damage, um, but also use this new industrial landscape as a means to serve as a catalyst for a regenerative ecological and uh, ecological approach that also facilitates community growth by nurturing community development and production. Um, upon learning more about the actual neighborhood of Point St. Charles itself, uh, apart from just doing general site studies, site analysis of understanding different um, points of access, uh, general, let's say, climactic conditions of the site, we did also come to realize that this is also a site that's very much driven by a, many community gardens for such a small neighborhood. So this idea of these well-maintained community gardens really brought people together. And so, um, with that, we started to dig a bit deeper into, okay, well, what are the opportunities for this site? We do understand that it's vastly large, but if we're thinking about the idea of bringing in new programs, what can we do with all this space? You can imagine how much contamination happens on a site of 13 acres, um, and so what are these different methods to perhaps think about reclamation of entities that are already coming onto site naturally, such as water, um, and how does that start to transfer into uh, the understanding of perhaps providing um, a new type of system or a new uh, integration of new systems that can facilitate new growth. And in this sense, we were starting to do research in terms of what are these, let's say, water remediation techniques. And starting off at a very more technological approach, perhaps a bit more mundane, but this is a really was a crucial starting point to really facilitate uh, new possibilities in relationship to potential uh, contextual elements such as a garden. And so the idea of a living machine was introduced to us, and this is basically the idea of a, um, a wastewater filtration system that uses plants to remediate and clean the water. So upon the discovery of this living machine, we did really start to dig a bit deeper into understanding what types of agricultural research was going on. We're more familiar with the idea of what a geoponic system is. So a geoponic system is basically plants that are planted in soil in the ground. But there's a lot of other types of, let's say, these ponic systems that you might be aware of, such as hydroponic, aeroponic systems, hydroponic being plants that are planted in or, or placed in water, uh, nutrient-filled water, aeroponics being plants that are suspended in air but are misted uh, with nutrient-filled mist. To, and these are means to really reduce the environmental impact of how much land needs to be used or how much water needs to be used as well. And so by starting to introduce and understand more about the, the, these potential or these new innovative agricultural systems, how do we start to really imagine this integration onto our own site? Before doing that though, simultaneously trying to understand these systems, we did also want to see, okay, well, who are these individuals and groups also doing research on them, um, on these systems already? And how can we perhaps think about a more collaborative way to bring all of this together um, into a kind of layered approach of understanding the kind of intersections of community, um, agriculture, uh, production as well. And ultimately this thinking really allowed us to visualize in tandem with let's say trying to sketch out ideas for this uh, competition, a layering in order of these, these symbiotic relationships that really centered around these main nodes and these, these ponic relationships. Um, and, it's in, and really the, the site became a place for not only now community gathering, which we already wanted to facilitate for the neighborhood, but becomes a place that really starts to cultivate new means of agricultural innovation that centers around, again, these different types of systems that, again, derive from our just general inspection and understanding of the site itself. And so when we, if I were to, I guess, go back to the diagram, there may be some logic visually to it, but then how do you translate this idea to an actual design? Um, and so the, the kind of iterative approach was very, very key in this aspect where how we, we were testing out different ideas, different configurations of the site. But some of the things that maintained throughout was that, um, the, the implications of the general site response itself and how to integrate these ponic culture systems into the site. 
Um, the design of the master plan itself did really come from, again, this combination of site understanding um, and constraints of the site. So generating natural topographies to uh, address specific conditions on the site. So let's say, as an example, adjacency to train tracks, how do you start to manipulate topography to create a berm to block out some of that noise? The creation of that berm naturally creates a valley to allow for water runoff to collect in a specific area. And so this combination of, let's say, these site systems and understanding of site context and a manipulation of very subtle elements to address these site conditions allow for a very, perhaps more organized method of introducing this water management system that ultimately facilitates um, these new microcultures that happen within these specific nodes that kind of puncture and carve out into these uh, overall system, uh, these overall buildings. The buildings in general were a bit more, let's say, generic, starting off with just the idea of passive strategies of understanding solar orientation uh, and wind, but then the intersection of all these other layers start to really form um, specific moments that really cater towards these specific, um, let's say, pawnee cultures that, that we called them. So, for me, there's a combination of understanding general site parameters, but also kind of bringing in this layer of research and, and, and thinking about the potentials that can really happen on a site. So again, this is stuff that we formulated from our own minds where we weren't given a specific type of program or parameters to do this. So how do you, and, and, and when that all comes together, when you're trying to pitch this as a narrative, it does become um, pretty important for me, as you'll see later on in the talk as well, that the drawing has to be a very kind of clear method of showcasing these ideas in one cohesive format. So basically all of those axes that you saw were initially studied as individual pieces, but do come together to try and form a cohesive narrative for the overall proposal of the site as well. Um, the uniqueness of Pawnee cultures really relies on that thoughtful layering of these complex systems, and that layering of systems also starts to transform a little bit into the actual morphology of the buildings, where you can start to see the movement of the building um, in the ground and above ground, but also the, the shaping of these spaces as you imagine how some of these uh, Pawnee systems come into play when, you're, when it's starting to intersect these spaces as well. Um, and we, we are really trying to engage in these, or we were trying to really engage in types of dialogue that can really facilitate and speak back to um, larger community initiatives where you can imagine now that if this was a space that was actually built, it could cater to the adjacent community because there was already a flourishing, um, let's say, agricultural community um, within Point St. Charles. Um, and so with this proposal, um, it was more of, it was an ideas-based competition, so we, it wasn't built. Um, it would be really interesting to see how it would come turn out if it was built, um, but it really did play a key role in allowing and validating our approach to how we start to design things as well. It's like we were um, able to really bring in new ideas and pitch ideas that perhaps were never thought of and we couldn't find necessarily precedent for this specific type of project, but this allowed us to also participate uh, broader beyond the scope of the work in uh, sustainable design, sorry, sustain, sustainability symposiums where with like-minded individuals who, is thinking about, who were thinking about larger questions of sustainability to also showcase and demonstrate that architecture has that potential to really integrate these systems as well, apart from just it being an isolated, let's say, engineering system that, um, that addresses larger issues of sustainability. Um, so to enable, uh, to enable is to give something or someone that authority or means to do something. Uh, one of the most valuable lessons I learned uh, as an intern actually through one of my co-ops here at Waterloo was that the, the, way, the way for you to learn what architecture is or how architecture is, and at the time I believe my mentor meant uh, capital A architecture, is that you need to learn how to build a building from start to finish. Um, this really resonated with me as a student and so this is something I really kept in mind as I continued to move forward with my career. And after grad school, um, I did start this, let's say, start to finish mentality at Atelier Barda, um, a small firm in Montreal that when I joined at the time was only three uh, full-time staff. Um, this ultimately meant that because we were a small office working on small projects, everyone had a crucial role in ensuring this collaborative approach to create successful projects. And so we were also basically each given our own project um, to work on and somewhat in a way sometimes thrown in the deep to try and figure it out um, ourselves or collectively actually. Um, so picture here is Maison Gaultier. Uh, it's a country house that draws inspiration from the client's love for minimalist painting, uh, paintings, uh, specifically Ellsworth Kelly. So if you're familiar with Ellsworth Kelly's work, there's some angular elements that you can start to read in the, let's say this void, um, this void massing model that we had created. Um, 
And for me, the work for this specific project really included early geometric studies and formal studies to understand the relationship of space to materiality to, to light as well. So really understanding that not only does architecture come from the facilitation of understanding program and space, but understanding the aspects of all elements that influence space at different scales as well. And this project ultimately um, moved on to win some awards, uh, interior, interior awards and shortlisted for many other awards that I won't need to mention as well. Um, after the time, after I left uh, Atelier Barda, the project was, became a case study for further, let's say, academic pursuits. There was times where I was teaching in different institutions and this house got brought up as a case study for students to analyze and explore as well. But it was also included in other exhibitions such as the 44 Low Resolution Houses exhibition that was curated by Michael Meredith of Moss Architects um, that was held at Princeton, um, I think, back in 2019, um, or yeah, I, I don't remember exactly the day, I have to check. But um, where we, it, it, the, the, the exhibition itself actually just explored 44 different types of houses um, through a double technological and representational lens, where in our case, the house really explored the composition of programming through uh, geometric and primitive shapes. Um, as a key member of Atelier Barda's, uh, Barda's formative years, my contributions did also extend beyond just the design practice itself. Um, it was a very well-known, or is becoming, an, uh, becoming a well-known firm within the context of Quebec, and I really tried to also find ways to engage and pull them outside of Quebec as well. This ultimately led us to contribute to different, let's say, articles um, in larger international publications, but also led us to winning um, the Architecture Emerging and Talent Award at the Design Exchange Museum in Toronto back in 2017. Um, it was really my first insight into seeing how the operation of an emerging practice um, came to be uh, through the lens of business, but also through the lens of approaching design um, a bit more intimately and collaboratively. Uh, at the time, the team really considered themselves as like the daft punk of the industry, where they were trying to build uh, a reputation by getting all these accolades, but still remaining quite anonymous to the impacts of, let's say, these, these awards, and really trying to focus on forging connections and relationships with individuals who are seeking much more than just a really pretty building. And so, as I honed in on my skills as an architect, I really started to reflect back on what my, told, uh, my mentor told me. So, yes, you can learn, let's say, architecture through the start to finish mentality, but for me, questions again started to ruminate in my head. Is that it for me? Like, am I going to be just working at my desk and drawing for the rest of my life? Um, that was something that started to uh, weigh heavy on me. And as someone who thinks a lot about these larger questions as well, I really started to question my place in certain design practices and the types of work that um, they were doing. And so this really led me to, um, I, I started to expand upon some of these experiences and questions at SVN Architects and Planners where I did start off as an architect and now I'm an associate uh, leading numerous uh, complex projects. And it's, SVN is a really a firm that prioritizes the creation of healthy communities through a regenerative and a sustainable lens that really encompasses social and environmental frameworks. Um, I'll talk through another project here that you see, uh, it's, a, it's a site for a new industrial manufacturing facility, uh, the headquarters uh, for this new site, uh, for this new company. And this is a company that has, let's say, over 50 years of history. And so you can imagine industrial site older company, you can imagine that there may be some limitations in terms of how conversations can go and which direction you imagine these types of projects would go to. At first, I've never imagined myself working on an industrial facility ever, um, but it's proved to be quite a fruitful and interesting challenge to tackle, especially with the questions that were, again, coming through um, in my own mind. So again, how do we approach this as a firm that, let's say, thinks about sustainability and social, um, social equity and contributions to the community, but simultaneously working on a greenfield site that hasn't had any building done, and we know that architecture has an impact on embodied uh, or carbon, uh, carbon footprint, but how do we approach this uh, with a larger question, and how do we find means to create better and more informed design decisions and uh, spaces for the actual people using them as well? So like most client uh, projects, you're usually given a list of requirements similar to what you receive in studio. Um, but when you're thinking about a more complex project, there's much more to think about as well. And so when it comes to an industrial facility that has much more than just an office space, but it has warehouses, shops, utility buildings, it's almost in a way, if you're looking at this diagram, you're working on basically three different buildings and you're trying to find a way to distill all this information together. And so how do you even approach this? Uh, because there's so many minute details that they're requesting for and how do you bring this into or pull out and think about the larger picture of the actual project itself. 
for us, it's quite important, and particularly for me, it's, uh, it's crucial to really develop a framework that ensures that no matter what happens throughout the design process, we establish a set of design principles that we always fall back onto. Um, and these, these, this wheel of principles is um, a, and, uh, it, it really started to develop as we started to have more conversations with the client to understand a little bit more what their culture of the company was like and what the direction of uh, the company's trajectory, uh, where they wanted to basically take the company. And, and so we build upon not only their environmental, social, and government goals, their ESG goals, but really start to also integrate what we think can potentially bring in new opportunities to really push this company to a more modern time to also facilitate new means and methods to improve not only their environmental footprint uh, for the environment, but also ensure that it's also a place that really fosters employee well-being. Um, so these goals were really an iterative process. We didn't just come up with these out of nowhere. There was a lot of research that was done. There's a lot of, inter uh, not interviews, but conversations again with the clients back and forth. And really it allows us to push ourselves in specific directions that again, go beyond just understanding how to create efficient spatial relationships. Um, and of course, that is one of the key elements that we need to be thinking about, the operational efficiency, but there's also a lot of other elements that we can start to um, integrate and think about as well. In a means to synthesize this information, so again, that larger program chart, we do start off by distilling their general program and understanding the design brief in a very tangible manner. Um, through this design brief, we're also starting to, we're able to really criticize and pick out specific types of program and question why they're there in the first place. The, let's say the, the need for some offices to have private bathrooms in a time um, where it might have worked when it, in a specific time period, but perhaps now when we're thinking about accessibility hierarchy as well uh, within a company structure, how do we perhaps push even something as small as a bathroom um, into a more, let's say, contemporary um, time. And so this really allows us to bring together some of these elements within these different facilities and combine them into what we call this more common area where you can imagine that these facilities, each having their own little nuances, come together into a more collaborative space and environment that really also starts to expand upon its relationship to the environment as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, historically these various facilities were really separate and largely separated by function and also um, divided by large circulation and storage yards. Our approach to the challenge really highlights the opportunities to rethink the company's operational efficiency while also prioritizing the users inside the building. And so the proposal really reframes the site-wide operational um, separation by unifying the large facilities into a interior street that brings those common programs together. And it, it really also starts to allow us to create a more, let's say, campus-like feel to this uh, traditionally separate facility, um, which then wraps itself around this, uh, or wraps around what we wrap around is a connective veil that starts to provide an architectural expression for the company that not only functions, at, let's say, as an architectural dresser, but also a means to really start to identify specific key programming within the building, but then also a means to also think about the idea of employee comfort. You can imagine that people are always going in and out through the rain, through the snow, um, in these instances when they're using these other facilities. So this large connective veil, again, also functions as a means to protect um, from the weather as well. So little gestures that we're trying to integrate into this larger project. One of the big wins of this project is that we were actually, or and one of the advantages of SVN being an integrated design practice uh, is that we have landscape architects, we have urban designers, planners with us as well. And this also helps us establish a continual dialogue to illustrate the significance of this connection to the exterior and to nature itself. Um, and this is a client who initially imagined that their landscape would be just sod, uh, very low, uh, low maintenance, just grass. And so the kind of idea of us even being able to convince them to bring on in a landscape architect to facilitate new potentials for interaction um, for their own employees and for larger community events was quite substantial. And basically, we're also now able to explore our overall design principles in a new way. So we're also able to think about the ideas um, from the interior of the building or the building scale and now to a larger site strategy scale as well. Um, as I'd mentioned earlier, um, di diagramming for me is a very clear way to distill a lot of information. So if we were able to go back to that program chart, you can see that there's a lot of, let's say, different nuances within the actual office portion of the building. And so I use this as a method to try and rationalize specific design decisions that I pitch to the client and say, for example, well, if we're trying to foster employee well-being and ensure that that's one of the key goals within the offices, how do we start to split out these programs to allow that and ensure that enough daylight gets into this building um, that's quite large and organize it in a way where the, we liberate that perimeter to allow for this to happen. 
in conjunction with um, this design that's ongoing, we always run environmental analyses at the very beginning of projects to really use this as a design tool for our iterative, iterative approaches as well. Um, in the case of this daylighting diagram, you can see to the left that this is kind of the original plan that was developed just based on efficiencies and, and program adjacencies that was requested by the client. And then to the left, um, an integration of very simple moves such as skylights uh, into the space where you can see that the dark blue on the left starts to disappear on the right when we introduce those elements. And this also starts to play um, a larger conversation as to the hierarchy of how we organize space as well. Because traditionally, again, as I'd mentioned, these spaces in their current office were lined on the perimeter with private CEO offices. All the interior was completely dark with no access to natural daylight um, for all their other employees. And so in a means to showcase that we can also provide the same amount of daylight for every single employee in the building, we were able to actually convince the client to allow that, again, that perimeter to be free to um, facilitate open office spaces and actually push in those enclosed private offices to the Interior, but showcase that they still have the same amount of daylight um, as everyone else. So trying to even break up those little nuances to, to fil facilitate better connections within the relationships in the actual company itself. Um, simultaneously, using this kind of environmental design tool to also start looking at how we can um, bring a bit more evidence and, uh, and reasoning to our design proposals. So again, this is a client that didn't really think about wanting something super design oriented, but we're trying to really bring in rational methods through our own research and practice to um, pitch different types of ideas. And so in this case, for example, the understanding of where the solar, um, well, solar orientation and just general daylighting strategies, using that environmental tool to also start to inform how we design our facade to ensure the comfort of the people inside because you might not want glare, for example, at specific uh, times of the day. Um, we are very much currently in development of the project, but again, the most fruitful rewards so far have been those really hard conversations with the clients. Um, to be able to illustrate and demonstrate in a way the advantages of considering not just what was given to us on paper, but all the people that would be using the space as well. And also really starts to uh, narrate that, or showcase the potential for a project again, to think that with a little bit of ambition, you can imagine let's say new opportunities for, for a company that might not have initially had that or have that in mind. Um, instead, instead of it now being in a kind of very separate, disparate kind of industrial yard, uh, it becomes much more of a campus-like space. We haven't really fully integrated landscape and everything yet, but it'll be coming soon, hopefully. Um, and what is the lesson learned from this so far? I'm still struggling with this, by the way. I get emails every day about how they want to push back sometimes, but you have to find a way to negotiate these wins and these losses at times as well. Um, but the lesson for me is that if we're not pushing or questioning what's given to us, we sometimes just become complacent to um, what the client wants. And generally what the client wants in, let's say, our industry, especially if you're seeing what's going up in many, many different areas of the city, is that you want a fast, efficient building that's very cheap. And so if you're not thinking or putting the time and effort to questioning some of this, you might not end up with opportunities that really can provide a better uh, environment for the people around, uh, or the people working or using these spaces, and also the environment around it itself as well. Um, so to engage is to participate or become involved in something. Um, at this point of my career, I'm starting to, I, I mean, at this point I hope to be able to demonstrate that I am a believer that architecture can start to encompass a broader narrative than what's just given to us. Um, and that our capital A architecture to me is now starting to shift beyond just, just knowing how to draw and knowing how to build. Um, and with this, this also comes at a time where I do start teaching um, as well. And so I had the opportunity to start teaching at the Interior Design School at Toronto Metropolitan University. And this really led me to kick off larger conversations with a larger body of people on a, on a more day-to-day -day basis. And so some of these conversations that I've had are now, um, that were with amongst, and amongst colleagues and, and clients are now also brought into the classroom to discuss with students. And as you know, we're more, we're thinking more, um, let's say, theoretically in, a, in the classroom. So we can really start to push some of these ideas further. Um, while I was teaching at TMU, I had the opportunity to curate and lead a fourth year final semester interior design options studio. And what I really wanted to do with the studio was to push these students as much as possible. Um, and that, not, not in a bad way, to really kind of showcase the potentials that they have as students as well as they start to go into practice. Um, and so this was also at a time where 
I mean, and ongoing discussions are happening centering around Ontario Place's future. Um, for those of you who don't know what Ontario Place is, it's, it is a landmark, let's say, uh, cultural building um, situated at Toronto's waterfront that was designed by Eberhard Zeidler. Um, its initial intent as a site was to um, serve as a space that provided accessibility for individuals who didn't have access to nature if you were living in the city. So the idea that sometimes you might not have access to a cottage outside, you'd be able to now have access to a kind of more um, manicured, let's say, natural landscape at the Toronto waterfront that also helped serve as a means to remediate the water industrial landscape at the time as well. Um, and generally when we're thinking about, let's say, larger buildings, city building initiatives, right now it's, there's a lot of news going around because um, there's a proposed private spa that's coming in to and take up a lot of, let's say, these, this built or natural landscape that was quite an important asset to people. Um, and generally when we're thinking about these larger conversations, we're thinking about city planners, we're thinking about um, government officials, we're thinking about architects, but as an iconic space that people also use or had used all the time on the inside, why aren't interior designers kind of included in this conversation? That was the question that I was trying to ask um, the students as well. And so what role can your design play as an interior designer to really speak to larger conversations beyond literally the walls of where you're usually confined to when you're given a project? So in my classroom in general, demonstrated success really extends beyond captivating imagery and um, efficient space planning. I really do that, believe that a successful project needs to bring into question, similar to, similarly to how I approach my own projects, a question that expands beyond, again, that context um, or the, the, the kind of program given to you. Um, I, I do my best to provide experiential learning environments facilitated to through different types of collaboration, um, immersive environments as well. Um, collaborative exercises as simple as a design shred, um, hosted virtually because we were still coming out of the pandemic, um, allowed the students to really explore these larger questions in new ways. I was able to bring in professionals from aligning industries, such as clients from not-for-profit organizations, um, landscape architects, urban designers, architects, to work with the students and to allow them to think a bit of a wider, to think more widely um, about the potential in forming a more socially uh, sustainable adaptive reuse of the interiors at Ontario Place. Um, the coursework and discussions as challenging, challenging Ooh, sorry. as challenging as it was um, to tackle some of these issues, really allowed the students to present contextually sensitive and research-driven proposals as well. Um, one, for example, using innovations in urban agriculture uh, to, to foster community. So I did not talk about my Pawnee Cultures project with the student at all, so this is a very different approach to similar ideas uh, that were starting to manifest in the student's mind as well. Um, so Kadi's project won the fourth year innovation award at the year-end show um, at the Interior Design School. From another perspective, uh, another student, Mei Mei, sought to really reflect on the impacts of Ontario Place um, and how it's had uh, over 50 years of, uh, let's say, uh, experiences and memories from different people. And so Mei Mei really demonstrated the power and agency that community had um, in the co-creation of architectural space, really embedded in the memory and participation um, through the creation of these actual building blocks that were, would pay homage to a lot of the monuments on, at Ontario Place that would eventually be taken down. Um, and there, there is a kind of narrative of thinking about how people can start to engage in the architectural process, albeit this is still very much conceptual approach as well. Um, and her project won the f uh, best of fourth year award. Um, with the studio as well. It was a few months after the conclusion of the course that myself and some of the graduates actually came together to facilitate larger discussions. We, we had a lot of interesting conversations and we were starting to get curious about what other people were thinking as well. What we were hearing on the news was very much centered around, let's say, the kind of political aspects of things, but not necessarily hearing voices from the actual community. And so this really led us to think about how we can bring some of these conversations out to the general public and how we can really engage students, um, professionals, and the general community to talk on broader broader issues that really relate back to everyone else as well. These discussions led to a self-funded exhibition uh, supported through various grants and sponsorships that bring our discussions into a political space um, that was much more grounded in reality as well. The exhibition was featured at the Design TO Festival earlier this year in 20, or yeah, earlier in January, um, where we were able to actually put this thing together in about 2.5 months. So it was a very intense period because we were trying to find a way and a pivotal moment to really create and foster these conversations. And so the conversations really revolved around Ontario Place as a public asset for the community, um, whereas the current, let's say, proposed privatization of certain aspects of the land really perhaps stray away from the original intent of the actual site itself. 
And so the exhibition expanded upon voices of my graduates who played a pivotal role in framing the narratives we want to convey. And that was to really ensure that the public had the right to voice their opinions and concerns regarding a larger public space that technically also belonged to them. Um, the exhibition was designed with transparency in mind uh, in a way to contrast one could argue the relatively opaque or translucent design process that um, this project was going through. And so um, as we're, I guess, approaching and using this, uh, this kind of design as a kind of means to be metaphorical in a sense, um, you're able to still distill specific information um, and kind of come up with your own narrative and perspective of the site as well. Um, through this research and this collaboration, not only amongst my graduates, but with other institutions within the city, um, different architecture firms, Zeidler Architecture, Gao Hastings, uh, School of Cities, and uh, Design Technology Lab, we really allowed this kind of commentary to facilitate, or we allowed this exhibition to facilitate commentary um, for the general public. And these layers the, the layering of screens allowed for different methods of interactivity um, and approach and allowed for people to really engage in artifacts in different ways. The exhibition also did receive a lot of, let's say, local news, and this also allowed students at that time to showcase the agency that their projects had and that their design methodologies could also have a potential positive impact um, beyond what their scope of work was in the design studio classroom. And so their, their voices were, in a way, elevated to the same levels as um, urban activists and, and city councillors that have been very vocal about this specific project and basically showcased to the, uh, let's say, the general public that there is perhaps opportunities to really allow these new approaches to design to facilitate larger conversations as well. Um, the intent of the exhibition was to really allow visitors to engage in various ways, to touch the material, to learn, again, the factual elements of, the, uh, of Ontario Place, to look at archived material and video footage um, as well, and to think, to really allow them to really, again, think about what the site meant to them or means to them, or even if they don't know or never had experiences on the site, how they can start to formulate a general perspective uh, or opinion about it. Um, these thoughts and opinions were collected in a few different forms. They were postcards that were shared that showcased different stages of Ontario Place where portions of it could be ripped off and commented on. You can tag it onto the board. There's an actual drawing board that people use to actually provide, um, let's say, design feedback or ideas in general, and also uh, a digital platform for individuals to upload memories and information that they want to share. So an example of that is a photo uh, by Jules McMillian um, where it was just a photo that was uploaded with no other context, but there's something personal about this at the same time, I can't really tell. Um, but various modes of interaction that, um, that allowed people to engage in different ways. Uh, within the span of seven days of the festival, we garnered about almost 400 responses um, of, of different types of opinions. And really by providing this platform for discussion, we allowed these individuals to really engage in their own debate. Some for the proposal, um, supporting this new development, some against, um, but I think that's also really the beauty of public engagement in general. There's always these differing voices and how do you take, in, take into consideration all these different perspectives? Because if you're thinking about, a design, let's say, a design in general, how are you ever gonna be able to appeal to every single person that this, this building or this space will impact? And so with the success of this exhibition, having it, um, being really completed in a short amount of time. Um, I, I really do aspire to create more opportunities, opportunities to engage in community and facilitate different type to, types of dialogue um, as well. If I were to do this, let's say, again, I would probably plan a little bit more ahead of time so that it didn't just get crammed into two months um, while still working on a bunch of other things. Um, but I would really use this as an opportunity to really showcase the power that collective presence and voice matters and reflecting and demonstrating the impacts that community has on shaping design or the design process. And really thinking about how the narrative of these ongoing politically driven, let's say, debates surrounding sustainability or uh, city building initiatives can really be impacted by the engagement of the community. Um, and so we get to the last portion of the talk, and that's when I start to put some of these ideas into a different method or mode of practice for myself. Um, to enact is to put into practice a belief, an idea, or a suggestion. Um, at this point, uh, as I start to share, I've done a few different things, and I feel like sometimes I think of myself, I can't figure out what exactly what I want to do, so I want to do everything. Um, and it becomes quite hard at times too, but if I were to reflect back on everything that I've done, there is a common thread um, that, I do believe 
that there's this hypothesis for myself that I can use this design or the, my design experience and knowledge to really facilitate new questions and new ideas. And so this really helps me perhaps or gave me the courage to establish my own design practice uh, called Never Only. Um, and the idea is that, and the belief is that design solutions within the built environment is never really only about the architecture itself. It's really beyond that, and it's about the impact that it has on its users and its community, um, and it's the site uh, that it's also situated in. And so I'm trying to basically use this as a platform to really start to investigate and push these hegemonic cultural ideas and current let's say traditional architectural practices to really try and engage more innovative research and responses that bring in a social and environmental awareness to foster and hopefully create healthy communities. This is a ambitious statement that I'm trying to, I, this is my goal and my ambition basically, but I'm still basically working towards trying to find ways to actually achieve that. <clears throat> um, of course, as I'd mentioned earlier with my experience in a emerging practice with Atelier Barda, there are obviously the realities of an actual running of a practice. How do you stay afloat when you want to be doing and exploring all these ideas? So there will be times where I would have to take on projects um, that are a bit more banal, um, basement renovations, just general additions, but this still provides me an opportunity to still practice that, say, that, that capital A architecture approach. And how I've always approached these design, let's say, exercises that I always give attention to detail for every single thing. And that really stemmed from, again, my experience at Barda, where you're thinking about every single detail, you're thinking about the finishes and how that all cohesively comes together. So these two are examples of projects that I've been working on. One is completed, um, renovation of an interior, um, of the interiors of a ground floor living room kitchen, and the other looking at um, a garden suite uh, in Toronto as well. Now, a question that I'm still, again, trying to answer is how do I bring these larger questions that I have into the scale of a small project? Um, when you're thinking about, let's say, me just trying to, I'm trying to just establish relationships with clients and build upon these questions, how do I bring in, like, am I gonna automatically bring in these large questions of social change to someone who wants to design, redesign their kitchen or redesign their house? Um, so this is something that's, a continual challenge that I'm trying to figure out. And I do understand, again, the, the practicalities of the profession. As a really customer-oriented profession, um, we do sometimes just don't get these conversations and these ideas across, and that's also okay. But then how do we start to bring in certain dialogues that may perhaps expose opportunities to the client to think beyond what they are currently seeking and see how th those opportunities can potentially even foster new types of projects later on as well. And so it's really thinking about business strategy, but also how do you find ways to integrate some of these ideas in a, in a less, let's say, um, confrontational way. And so with this, uh, with this house on Grace Street uh, by Trinity Bellwoods in Toronto, um, we're looking at this interwar semi-detached house um, where I really initially pushed for the idea of uh, increasing density on the site after the passing of Bill 23. Um, so the Bill 23 is basically a, uh, an act that changed uh, a bill that changed the Planning Act to allow for more density in residential neighborhoods in Toronto to try and adjust change, uh, challenges of um, affordability in the city and just access to, uh, to house housing. Um, so I did try and test out various options that would perhaps appeal to the client, um, just giving them different means and methods and ideas as to how they can provide enough space for themselves, but also p potentially facilitate new opportunities to introduce uh, different types of rental spaces for other individuals. And so I do know that there is a kind of stark difference and contrast between providing affordable housing versus a client wanting to provide additional rental housing for more income. So there is a distinction, but how do I try and fold in this conversation that potentially addresses larger issues? And so the idea, for example, thinking about the potential of introducing a laneway house through the affordable laneway suites pilot program that the City of Toronto has, where they're trying to introduce um, more affordable living in these lower density communities that um, cap, let's say, the rent at a specific height uh, or at a, at a specific maximum based on the city of Toronto's average, average market rent. And so those obviously would have benefits for the client who would want to build that. Um, these are, again, still ongoing discussions, um, and hopefully that can at least, again, introduce the potentials that they can also do a bit more in, in, these, in these, let's say, bigger moves that they're approaching in their own lives as well. If I were to jump into, I guess, quickly what... Um, it, the actual project itself as I'm currently working through it. Um, one of the things that the client just kept mentioning was the idea of these arches, uh, like arches, let's do arches everywhere. Um, and so I really want to think about that beyond just the aesthetic application. So 
again, again, the arches and let's say the interior renovation of the space itself, how do I think beyond and perhaps use a bit more of my spatial knowledge to convey different types of ideas and push that idea of the arch beyond just an application, thinking about how it can start to spatially inform specific um, volumes and also thinking about circulation uh, as well. Um, I do, again, as I mentioned earlier, I do try to put as much thought as possible into making a space functional, but also trying to find ways to make it relatively unique uh, in specific ways through simple gestures. Sketching really allows me to visualize some of these ideas and also just help translate these ideas into a plan that really helps the client understand um, these ideas a bit better. And so for this particular plan, there, there's this idea that there's a kind of service bar on the north side of the plan that serves the more livable spaces towards the south side of the building that then carries up throughout the rest of the, um, of the, of the house itself. One of the larger moves within the project really starts to think about the actual typology of the building. This being an interwar semi, it's one of these types of ty uh, buildings that are quite narrow. It's about 5.5 meters wide. And these are one of the smaller uh, semi-detached types of buildings. If you're thinking about a row house in general, the access to daylight within an interior or the depth of that space is not very um, nice because you're only getting basically light from the back and the front of the house. So introducing just simple, again, simple gestures of bringing in light wells really does start to change everything, um, where this introduction of this simple light well starts to really now notably create and provide access to daylight, daylight in every single room with, uh, of the house. And so um, this combined with trying to understand the kind of idea of the arch and the kind of volume studies, uh, and also creating a space that is very kind of key around the central gathering space for them, which is the kitchen, and also having the skylight puncture through this kitchen to create a more, let's say, um, interesting moment for them has really gotten them excited about the project. And I'm still in tandem with this, still trying to fold in these larger questions as well. So hopefully it, it goes somewhere. Um, and I know that I've told some of my students that never just export a render from Enscape, and I'm sorry that this is, <laughs> this is the case, but sometimes there are time constraints and you just have to do it. So I totally understand. Um, but again, overall, the kind of working process that has been facilitated has been a really engaging and big learning curve for me. We're not necessarily trained in school to learn how to run a practice, and I know some of my colleagues also know and go through the same situations. Um, and so how do you approach this in a, in a manner that you're trying to, for me anyways, be as approachable as possible to try and educate as much as possible and showcase that my role is not to really enforce specific ideas, but to keep an open dialogue with the client to really try and formulate new possibilities. And so I'll wrap up with one last project, um, which I'm currently working on right now. Um, again, as an emerging practitioner, we're think I'm thinking about my company. I'm trying to think about how I keep my buildings or my, my practice afloat. But how do I also still kind of keep these design juices flowing? I am still working at um, SVN as well, but I still want to find ways to express my creativity uh, in different means. And so that sometimes means seeking out different opportunities to explore these ideas through, let's say, the ideas of, um, through the approach of competitions. And so right now, I'm collaborating with my friend uh, Milan again on a submission for a pavilion for an international garden festival. Um, and so we're hoping to, let's say, loop back in some of these larger ideas that we had into a smaller scale building. So we stumbled upon a waste yard in Quebec that had these beautiful curved plywood offcuts. These are offcuts that were just displayed on the street. And if you didn't come get it, they basically would be brought to an incinerator and burned. And so this is in a way kind of interesting if you're thinking about waste production where normally everything's hidden behind closed doors. You don't really see what's happening. In this case of this specific manufacturer, they kind of left everything out in the open. Um, and so these offcuts were, again, open for people to take. And we really start to think about, okay, if this is such a small company that produces this amount of waste already, you can imagine how much waste is actually being produced on, in larger manufacturing facilities. Um, urban waste in general in the construction industry obviously has to have a large ar ecological impact through the contamination of bio waste um, uh, uh, through its own production, and knowing that the unfortunate production of waste will not be perhaps slowing down anytime soon, how can we find a way to bring, let's say, this coexistence of this damaging, damaging industry um, with something that's more ecological and more, let's say, naturalized um, as well? And so our proposal really brings a second life to this material through its coexistence um, with a resilient plant by the name of the amaranth. Amaranth is a really red burgundy-like plant, and it's a very underutilized resources, uh, underutilized resources, resource, um, and plant that really requires very little resources. It's also, there's more studies happening to really um, demonstrate that the amaranth is also really high in protein for individual, I mean, for people to consume, but also has enough, let's say, um, 
hardiness that starts to bring proteins back into the earth through phytoremediation as well. So it's a plant that also starts to remediate some of that land. Um, and so we, we want to bring these two things together to see how this dialogue can perhaps comment on the, the state of things and, and also perhaps provide an optimistic lens as to how this coexistence of garbage and waste can also still live in conjunction with a more natural habitat. Um, and so first and foremost, we just took as much, many of these offcuts as possible because what better way to explore ideas than working with a one-to-one -one scale model, uh, not a one-to-fifty or one-to-one hundred, but a one-to-one, -one. Um, and just exploring the potentials of how these, these elements can come together as a formal object but start to frame out different ideas and perspectives as well. Our proposal really creates an invisible path that traces through a series of pivoting screens staged in a field of amaranths. Um, and it's basically the amaranth, again, emblematic of a resilient plant that starts to remediate soil. It's really a commentary that perhaps brings into um, question the idea of urban uh, biocycling, remediation of the earth, and the kind of question of how much, how a gentle move or a small um, movement can also create repercussions later on as well. And so through the, let's say, each screen is constructed very simply through a kind of axial um, connection point that where they're stacked on top of each other through spacers that are connected by a simple cord. And basically, if you were to imagine the kind of touching of one of these fins, one move will start to move everything else as well. And traversing through each of these screens really start to allow for different perspectives to form, especially if you're imagining that this pavilion allows for different people to move in at various times as well. And it really starts to open up and frame out specific views to these amaranth plants in different ways. And so it's always an ever-changing type of installation um, and creates a, a subtle rippling effect that, again, we're trying to illustrate metaphorically that the kind of commentary on garbage also has these rippling effects on the environment as well. Um, so let's say in conjunction with this metaphorical commentary, the, the gestures really allow for viewers to see alternative possibilities um, for these two very separate items when they're brought together um, to understand that there's larger potentials for this coexistence to facilitate, let's say, beautiful spaces. The possibility is to address questions and bring awareness to these topics through uh, nuanced means, but still showcasing various possibilities that um, these challenges pose. And so what these questions and possibilities mean to me will continue to be explored here over the next few years. Um, I'm very excited to collaborate and see where these opportunities come. But if I'm really to reflect back on the work that I've presented, on one hand, I did start to realize that there was a thread of, let's say, this industrial type of project, which I never really thought of before. But at a larger scale, thinking about the trajectory of where I've gone and how I've started to touch upon all these different things that's happened, the one common thread is the approach of how I, um, or my approach to specific questions and problems of really, again, trying to facilitate these new opportunities and potentials um, with myself and with the people that I work with. And so ultimately, I've been able to really work on um, building a stance and point of view that seeks to answer my own curiosities and potentials within the profession. And again, as I mentioned, sometimes they are wins, sometimes they're not. Sometimes you just have to be patient and find the right time to bring up these conversations as well. And as a practicing architect, you'll realize that sometimes you'll just have to deal with whatever is given to you. But then what I've started to realize is that, yes, there's going to be these moments where you have to deal with these mundane things. But if you do have these interests for larger conversations, there will always be someone there or a colleague, a friend, someone in the community that, that has the same thoughts and questions in their mind that you can go to and facilitate these conversations um, with. So I leave off with this question, how can you enact change? Um, more so for myself, but also to you as future designers, um, to think about how your practices and methods can perhaps envision new opportunities beyond, again, the assignments that are given to you. Um, and again, I am excited to continue these conversations over the next two years uh, with colleagues, with faculty, uh, colleagues and faculty, or I guess the same, <laughs> uh, with students and the general community, um, and really seeing where these relationships go beyond the classroom. Um, thank you. <laughs>